summarizing all the really excellent stuff that you did. And it's a funny thing to say, but your work was one of the reasons why I was attracted to the job that I currently have. So thank you both very much. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say uh, was in response to things Monica and David said this morning. Um, I was moved by both of them. Uh, David sort of took us to the limits of thought. We could go no further. We'd run out of ideas. So we just put a question mark at the end of it and hope things were going to be fine. Um, and Monica did a very similar thing in, in Cumbria where she just showed the impossibilities really of balancing the many things that we face in the climate crisis compared to everyday mobility, inequality and very real tangible day to day concerns, which I think really perfectly echoed the big questions David was encouraging us to, to grapple with. So there was an intellectual subtlety and marvel there. And the final thing I wanted to say before I get on to my task, which really is to, to do the introduction to Mimi, um, is that I was sitting in my office on my way here thinking about this event and thinking about the history of the centre and the emotional charge of the day. And uh, my window was open. And depending on which way the wind is blowing, you can hear the steel of the rail <laughs> of the West Coast main line as the train passes. You can hear the rumble of the A6, but you can also hear the roar of the M6. <laughs> and also outside my window is the memorial to John Urry. And I wondered what role actually the location of the campus, the noise and the infrastructure that's all around us has played in the evolution of thinking about mobilities and it's come out of a very particular location surrounded by a very particular set of infrastructural priorities. Anyway, that's enough about me and my thoughts and my observations on the day. So Professor Mimi Scheller is known to all of you, I'm confident, uh, and is currently the inaugural dean of the Global School at Worcester, thank you very much. I couldn't decide which language to pronounce that in. <laughs> Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts uh, and was previously professor of sociology at Drexel and uh, founder of the Center for Mobility Research and Policy, um, something again I think many of you in the room will know. But in 1998, maybe career was based here uh, and in those early conversations with John Urry started the new mobilities paradigm, mobilities in italics as I learned to call it this morning from one of the presentations, the journal and indeed Seymour. And the, the mobility for the, the manifesto for the new mobilities paradigm was published in Environmental Planning A in uh, 2006. And just to give you an idea of how much, how far and wide the new, new mobilities paradigm has traveled, it's cited by around 7,500 people, uh, which is really quite a, an achievement and an astonishing um, statistic. So Mimi is an interdisciplinary scholar, as you will all know, with wide ranging interests that take us from the Caribbean into social theory, as well as um, mobilities and is currently principal investigator on something called the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network and has worked on numerous other funded successful projects. Mimi has also published a great deal, uh, over 140 influential articles and book chapters and a whole series of recent books, which I won't, won't run through the titles of, but it's an impressive array of scholarship that takes us from the islands through questions of modernity and mobility into forms of technology as well as into areas of inequality, all written, I think, in a very humanitarian and human aware sense. So in more recent times, the work on mobility justice has been incredibly influential and has resonated across all manner of disciplines and debates. And I think in the way that you see the way that the new mobilities paradigm has moved, so too that work on justice in relation to mobility will move through other disciplines and into other intellectual and academic spaces. But today Mimi's going to talk to us about the climate emergency, 
climate change, which has been a priority for the Centre for Seymour for the last few years. So it's with real great pleasure, and I've never met you either, although I've known who you are for years as well. Um, it's a great pleasure that I invite you to come to speak uh, and to deliver a lecture entitled Mobility Justice and Climate Reparations, reflected on 20 years of mobility research. So many thank you. Oh, can they hear? Can you no, hear me on you. Teams? Could we ask you to turn your cameras off while while we're doing the presentation? I think you might even be able to do it remotely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to go through the channel screen. Yeah. No, thank you. Yes. Now we have to Can you minimize them? Will that work? Yes. Okay. Great, so thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and um, thank you, Ed, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I don't know, I hear at Lancaster, we, at, we might uh, at, in the USA, Dean Simpson, but I know at Lancaster, we always used first names, which was always a wonderful thing that John Uri always extended to all of our visitors and graduate students. So we're all on a first name basis. Um, I wanna first thank all the organizers of this significant anniversary event at Lancaster University. It's so wonderful to be back here and to reflect together on these 20 years. It's hard to believe it's 20 years. Um, and, and that Penny, that you're still here. <laughs> Just a moment longer. Um, and, and all of you, um, thank you, Lynn Pierce for taking the lead in planning and organizing this incredible event. Um, I want to thank everyone at Seymour, um, Nicholas Sperling and Monica Busher and David Tyfield and Sharon Wilson and Jen Southern, who has joined us um, online, um, and everyone who's made it possible um, for us to be together here over the years. Um, and I know some of some of our, our friends who might be online, and I can't see everybody, but I also wanted to, um, before I begin, thank um, Carlos Lopez Galvez, um, who's kept involved with at the Institute for the Future and other things here at Lancaster. Um, colleagues like um, Rodanthi Tanelli, who um, I've been working with on a piece for the journal Transfers. And I know I saw Heis Mom online briefly. Um, we're doing a collection um, about John Ari's work and its influence. And um, I'll say Rodanthi gave me a little bit of feedback for today's talk, which is linked to that um, journal publication. I recently also had the opportunity to visit our colleagues in Brazil. And I don't know if any of them are here with us today, but I want to thank Tiago Alas, Bianca Ferreri Medeiros, Camila Morres, Joel Alcantara de Freitas, all of whom knew John and worked with John and with Seymour, some of them visited here, and they've created an incredible new hub of mobilities research in Brazil. Um, so with that said, um, I, and let me just say one more word about Penny. I mean, Penny, uh, our tireless managing editor of the Mobilities Journal, um, and thanks to David Tyfield and to Pete Ad, um, and you know everyone who's been involved in keeping the journal going, but when when we launched um, Seymour two decades ago, John kind of brought you in as the administrator and the what I call the administrator extraordinaire, who has just been incredible. And um, I think when John launched and I together launched this, what we thought of this, this little enterprise back in 2003, we fully realized it would be Penny who would keep the ship afloat. And none of this would have happened without you. So thank you for that. Um, so let me say, I'm gonna um, talk about these reflections. And 
When I arrived at Lancaster University as a lecturer, my first job as a lecturer in 1998, um, my conversations with John Ari immediately turned to thinking about his work that I saw as coming out of a European historical tradition and formation of social theory and critical social thought and his particular location in Lancaster, as Ed mentioned, there is something very particular about the view of the world from here. And we immediately sort of had this conversation between that thought and my perspective that was coming out of studying the Caribbean region and the Americas and the Atlantic world and a perspective from reading in the like 80s, 1980s and 1990s, feminist theory, post-colonial theory, and Caribbean and Black theorists. And I personally would argue that it was this entree of a sort of transatlantic feminist and post-colonial perspective into European social theory that sparked the emergence of the new mobilities paradigm. And that's what I want to talk about today, because I think while many people have read the mobility's turn as kind of coming out of a British and European tradition of critical theory, I believe it was in fact this, this infusion, this meeting of post-colonial feminist and Caribbean critical theory with that tradition that contributed to new ways of thinking about power, inequality, relational ontologies, and other parts of the mobilities paradigm, which um, I'm I was very interested, David Tyfield spoke this morning about these um, new developments that are happening. And what I'm going to do is, again, um, a return to how those new developments are actually in the beginning of the, the mobilities paradigm. Secondly, I want to argue that critical mobilities theory and practice, applied practice, needs to maintain a kind of decolonial emphasis if it is going to address the pressing issues of the climate emergency today. And I'm not going to fight over whether we talk about post-colonial, decolonial, anti-colonial. I'm not going to go into that today. I'm just going to say decolonial for now. But the push towards post-carbon futures requires that the countries and industries that have driven climate change pay climate reparations to those most impacted by climate change, climate hazards that they did not cause, those who are most vulnerable to them, and to mitigate and repair the damage already done. And I think it's only by lashing together this kind of critique of European modernity, which John Uri was engaged in, right, through work on automobility, on carbon capitalism, on tourism, on offshoring, all of that needs to be joined with an awareness of their colonial reverberations and the decolonial critique that was there at the beginning of the mobilities paradigm if we are going to effectively move towards imagining and enacting alternative futures. Because we've talked a lot about them, but I feel like it's been 20 years and we haven't changed things enough yet in the world. Insofar as the Center for Mobility's research um, recently, fairly recently announced its new manifesto, right? For if, if, if you haven't seen it, it's online, manifesto for 2020 to 2025 to urgently address the climate emergency. Then I believe this ongoing work of Seymour must keep in view the transnational and decolonial project out of which I will argue the new mobilities paradigm emerged. Only by decentering what we used to call the West, or maybe more say now the global North, only by decentering the global North and by showing the complex global interrelations of immobilities and mobilities with these material, cultural, and ecological processes around the world, will we succeed in what the manifesto calls for just an ecological mobilities transformation. And moreover, I'm going to posit that this work of decentering or shaking up dominant European or Anglo-American epistemologies and ontologies is exactly what the mobilities paradigm set out to do. That's what it was there for. Its post-disciplinary approach drew on 
things like relational ontologies, practice theory, performativity, creative action, mobile methods, utopia as a method, in order to seek um, to open an experimental place or space of action, which I've elsewhere referred to as a live sociology that is like in vital, engaged with the world, um, as Monica Bush's work, as we heard, has been an incredible example of. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly sketch, hopefully, um, how feminist and Caribbean critical theory sparked our collaborations on the new mobilities paradigm and its origins in the early 2000s. Then I'll turn to how the work on post-carbon energy transitions throughout the 2000s and, and 2010s went beyond like a critique of transportation practices and the policies of major cities, the global north. A lot of people like think the work on automobility is about like that alone. Um, but instead, the analysis of the system of automobility within the new mobilities paradigm, inspired by John's work on that in particular, was a project to dismantle a worldwide system of uneven mobilities that is premised on colonial extraction, indigenous displacement, imperial domination, and the ongoing privileging of kinetic elites. That's what's behind a system of automobility transformation. It's not just about people riding their bikes with all credit to people riding their bikes as part of that transition too. Finally, this analysis of complex and entangled cultural political ecologies through the new mobilities paradigm arrives at an analysis of global immobilities and mobilities that I would argue unites with recent projects of decolonial ecology, to use the title of Malcolm Ferdinand's book, he's a Caribbean theorist from Martinique, and confronting climate coloniality, project that Farhana Sultana is working on now, and that we um, were involved in a recent series of panels at the last um, American Association of Geographers con conference. And at least to say, this has been um, my the trajectory of my thinking and a direction that I want to argue is necessary now more than ever. So looking back over the last 20 years or so of the field of mobilities research, obviously we can't fit all of it <laughs> in one slide, but um, just a few of the cover titles that um, stand out and also have like nice images on the front of them. Um, the field of mobilities research has grown impressively. It's spread around the world. It's generated multiple journals, centers, research initiatives, and I'm not going to re review those all today. I just wanted to give a nod to this um, and to um, kind of point towards the extent of the field. And, you know, in, um, in 2016, John and I co-published co um, our last article that we wrote together called Mobilizing the New Mobilities Paradigm and it appeared in the first issue of the journal Applied Mobilities. And there we reviewed a decade of work and we talked about a fundamental recasting of social science. And we focused on three theoretical influences in that article, complexity theory, socio-technical transitions and social practice theory. And we tried to show their role in understanding uh, climate adaptation, decarbonization and low carbon transitions. But I want to add to that now that um, we also want to include in these, I want to include in these theoretical origins of the new mobilities paradigm, this broader um, set of influences on, on our work. Collectively, you could say the world, we, society, we've made some progress towards shifting some of the overarching cultures of mobility that are materially embedded in carbon form and in fossil fuel, fossil energy extraction, but we haven't done enough, right? The problem of change, of transformation seems as intransigent as ever. And this was something that John Ari dwelled upon in his last monograph, What is the Future? Um, if you remember that book, it, it, it lays out different like future scenarios. It has a kind of gloomy ending because it seems like we're, we're headed towards some pretty dystopian futures. But he talks there about different ways of, of thinking about the future, learning from the past, from failed futures, from dystopias, from utopias from extrapolation and from scenario building. So different ways to think about the future. 
The planetary crisis um, of climate, as Seymour has recognized in its manifesto, seems to demand more redoubled, tripled action in our academic institutions, in our systems of education, in our fields of knowledge creation, in our engagements with the world. So um, at the very end of my talk, I'm going to come back to think a little bit about the future of education and draw on some of my experiences um, of the Global Projects Program at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, which is in Worcester, Massachusetts, but we maintain ties with Worcester, England, I should say, our namesake, <laughs> reminding us of our transatlantic and colonial origins, right? Um, so let me begin with um, some of the, these are just some of the centers that, that were involved. And when, when we were reflecting on this in 2016, um, you know, we talked about our colleagues at um, Alborg University, at Roskilde, at um, EPFL in Lausanne, at Concordia University in Montreal, the emerging Latin American cluster of mobilities researchers, Australia, um, and many others. And now, as we heard earlier today, we must add to that the um, Institute for Mobility Humanities in Padua and the um, Academy of Mobility Humanities at Concord University, and OSMOB, the Australian Mobilities Network, among others, and this is just a to, to, uh, reminder of that sort of growth of the field and map of it. Um, let me, okay, so let me move into the next part of my talk on feminist and post-colonial influences on critical mobilities research. So the first major event that um, John and Penny, I believe, and, and I co-organized around mobility studies at Lancaster was the Alternative Mobility Futures Conference, which was held, I, I think if I have this right, in 2004. So the center was formed in 2003, but the conference happened in January 2004. So it was linked to the launch of the center. And among the topics were auto mobility, aero mobility, surveillance and vision technologies, tourism, and notably viruses and viral mobility. At the time, there was foot and mouth disease in um, animals in the UK that uh, John Law wrote about. And many of those topics were um, brought together in the special issue of Environment and Planning A, which came out of that conference called Materialities and Mobilities, in which the article, The New Mobilities Paradigm, was like the introduction. At that time, John and I had already published our co-authored article, The City and the Car, which came out in 2000. And um, that was our first foray into sort of a critique of the system of automobility. We, in 2003, we published Mobile Transformations of Public and Private Life, which also was looking at aspects of automobility and mobility and cities and space and place. And at the time of the Alternative Mobility Futures Conference, we were co-editing the book Tourism Mobilities, Places to Play, Places in Play, which was published in 2004. Um, so the, the special issue of Environment and Planning A came out right in, in 2006, but it came out of that conference along with an edited volume called Mobile Technologies of the City. So just to give a sense of the breadth of different things we were working on. Now, when you hear that list of publications, none of those at first glance appear to have especially feminist or post-colonial theoretical purchase. And so you might think, well, what does that have to do with it? But that would be to miss the underlying strong undercurrent of post-colonial and Caribbean theory, as well as Caribbean feminist theory, critical feminist theory, because at the time leading up to all of those publications that I just mentioned, I was completing my own book, Consuming the Caribbean, which came out in 2003, and working on the co-edited collection, Uprootings, Regroundings, Questions of Home and Migration, with Sarah Ahmed, Claudia Castaneda, and Marie Fortier, who were all professors here at the time. And we were also in conversation with Sarah Ahmed's early work called Strange Encounters, Embodied Others in Postcoloniality. And if you know Sarah Ahmed's work, you know, she went on to publish millions of other books, more, even more than me um, or John or anybody. 
Um, and our, but our close colleagues, also Sarah Franklin and Jackie Stacy, along with Celia Laurie, had just published their book called Global Nature, Global Culture, which brought feminist theory into conversation with constructions of nature and global consumerism. So these works influenced the conversation about the emerging mobility's turn by bringing post-colonial feminist perspectives to bear on power relations within immobilities and mobilities via questions of materiality, embodiment, migration, strange encounters, and post-colonial consumption. And it was those productive engagements across fields that helped generate mobilities research as a mobile and transdisciplinary field, I would argue. Um, and, and lead to some of my subsequent work. Um, so in the new mobilities paradigm, the article that introduced this special issue, um, it included feminist theorists, their critique of privileged mobilities, where we cite Karen Kaplan on the romantic reading of mobility and the privileging of cosmopolitan mobility, it quotes Sarah Ahmed and points to this uh, problem of the idealization of movement or transformation of movement into a fetish, which depends upon the exclusion of others who are already positioned as not free in the same way. It also considered, quoting Bev Skaggs, who was another colleague of ours at the time, how mobility and control over mobility both reflect and reinforce power, mobility as a resource to which not everyone has an equal relationship. And fourth, it, the introduction of the new mobilities paradigm traces this back to the critique of the colonial modes of ordering and knowing that informed many 20th century human sciences, citing Homi Baba, Avtar Bra, James Clifford, um, and Dareshwar, Paul Gilroy, Jane Ifequanugwe, Stuart Hall. Those were all there in the origin of the new mobilities paradigm, which is often not the, those origins are not cited. They often get left out of the paradigm. And when they're often claimed as arriving or new or emerging, I want to remind people they were there at the beginning. They sparked the beginning. And that we want, I want us to avoid um, a, a, what I might refer to quite bluntly as a whitening of the mobilities paradigm by dropping out certain kinds of citational origins of it. Um, the special issue that came out of it included articles by Divya Tolia Kelly on British Asian migrants landscapes of belonging in Britain. Um, it included an article by Nupar Gojia on migrant seasonal workers uh, who were being contrasted with Western backpackers. Uh, so it, it had like a very diverse beginning point. And it was, it was these productive engagements across fields, as I said, that helped generate mobilities research as a transdisciplinary field. I also want to refer to some of my introduction to my 2003 book, Consuming the Caribbean, because there I observed that within the discipline of sociology, in particular, accounts of modernity proceed as if the so-called developing world or third world can simply be bracketed off from the central concerns, models, and theories of the contemporary condition. And I criticized Anthony Giddens, Ulrich Beck, and Zygmunt Bauman on this score and drew attention instead, I, I said, to the work of D.L.R. James, Franz Fanon, Edward Said, Homi Baba, Paul Gilroy, Stuart Hall, Cobino Mercer, Antoinette Burton, Anne McClintock, Sarah Ahmed, and others who are basically post-colonial theorists who insisted on the relation between here and there, who traced much deeper histories of mobilities and immobilities. It was always a historical discipline. In my eyes, it wasn't just, I mean, and to speak to Colin's arguments, it wasn't just about, oh, the world is more mobile now. Um, sometimes it got characterized that way. Um, and sometimes that shows up in some of the publications, but for me, it was always hundreds of years of, at least, of mobilities that I was studying. And my entire mission in this book, Consuming the Caribbean, 
was to trace the entangled economic, ecological, material, and cultural mobilities and immobilities of the Atlantic world in order to contribute to a more complicated history and theory of travel, linking together the colonial and the post-colonial, the scientific and the aesthetic, the material and the symbolic, to quote the book. Um, and, and I believe that John Uri and others here at Lancaster appreciated that perspective. And that's what led to it being a new paradigm and to the idea of founding a center and founding a journal. Building um, on our editorial collective's argument in the introduction to Uprooting's Regroundings, which was written with my other three colleagues here at Lancaster, as well as the work of Tim Cresswell at that time, which we were reading on the production of mobilities, we called for theorists of modernity and mobilities to also attend to the things and people that are kept in place in order to enable the mobility of others. So from the beginning, this was not about mobility as freedom. It was not about the world becoming more mobile. It was about a power relation of mobility and immobility of some people's freedom of movement requiring others to have less freedom and less liberty. And we sought to expand upon Cresswell's questions about asymmetrical power relations which I should say were influenced by Doreen Massey, right? The geographer, feminist geographer. And um, also Cresswell had done work on sort of vagabonds and hobos in the United States um, and had picked up more of, um, I think, critical, black critical theory in the US. And we cited in this introduction, Cresswell's questions, which is, the question of how mobilities get produced, both materially and in terms of ideas of mobility, means asking who moves, how do they move, how do particular forms of mobility become meaningful, what other movements are enabled or constrained in the process, who benefits from this movement. And I know you're wondering, I'm supposed to be talking about climate and climate reparations, I'm coming back to them because these are the questions that we need to ask about climate transformations and about climate reparations, about particular forms of mobility and the constraint and enabling of different forms of mobility. But I will strongly argue that it was this perspective on unequal relational immobility and mobility informed by feminist theory, historical study of the Americas and the other colonial contexts of the Atlantic world, that sparked the emergence of the new mobilities paradigm, the forming of the Center for Mobilities Research, the launching of the journal Mobilities as a locus for pursuing these topics of study that included, as when we introduced the journal, mobilities, immobilities, and moorings, right? And it was important to include all of those. And we used that moorings metaphor. It's like an oceanic metaphor, right? So it's boats that have moorings. And, so we were thinking about that transatlantic world. Um, okay, so let me turn now in the second part of my talk to automobility, low carbon transitions and mobility justice. As we've argued for two decades in critical mobility studies, dominant mobility systems involve interlocking socio-ecological economic practices racial regimes, industrial and business networks, geopolitical and military power, and ongoing relations between mobility, energy production, extractive industries, land use, and displacement. So when you go back to the city and the car that was written in 2000, published in 2000, we were writing it in 1999, those arguments were already there. And this interlocking system of automobility, as we called it, is controlled by powerful kinetic elites, to use a term that came up a little bit later in the field, through mobility regimes, which you can think of as hegemonic practices and discourses and governance and infrastructures that shape what Anthony Elliott and John Ari talked about as mobile lives of those in power, while controlling or determining the movements and displacements of others. So an approach building on critical mobility theory leads to understanding that the dominant system of automobility 
is not just a means of transportation. And it's not even just a technology of energy use, of using fossil fuels to move, but it's a complex system of social practices, gendered racial regi regimes, global industrial and business networks that shape space and time through infrastructural arrangements and creates differential mobile subjectivities. Um, I should mention on the cover of this book, Mobilities and Complexities, which was co-edited with Oli B. Jensen and Sven Kesselring, is an artwork by Dan Schimmel, who's here in the audience. Speaking of artists and mobilities, that's my partner, Dan. Hi, Dan. <laughs> uh, thank you for your artwork. <laughs> um, so this question of the dominant system of mobility, it means crucially that any effort to overcome the system and transition towards what we might think of as sustainable mobilities must be a worldwide effort that considers not just what happens in a particular mode of transportation, not just what happens in a particular city, whether it has bike lanes or doesn't have bike lanes or good public transit systems, but it also has to consider these multinational corporate mobilities, global resource extraction, the control of labor mobilities, the military domination that supports industrial development and locational decisions by industries. All of that is part of thinking about low carbon transitions, which are also only one part of the issues driving mobilities research, which, question, which also touches on many other questions of mobilities and power. So those are the things that I see as at the heart of the new mobilities paradigm. In addition, mobilities research helps us to see the wider system of immobilities slash mobilities in which transportation and energy markets are situated. So um, I, I mentioned extractive industries, which I've written about in my book, um, Aluminum or Aluminium Dreams. And, um, but you know, unequal global mobility includes the carbon intensive use of air travel, which we've talked about the logistics of shipping and how the law of the sea works. Um, you know, the question of deep sea mining that's on the agenda right now, uh, but it also includes the rights to cross-border mobility of refugees and migrants, um, the dispossession of indigenous people's lands and waters around the world, which is ongoing, right? These the new enclosures and expansions of indigenous extractive industries for the green transition, so-called green transition, are part of this. These complex interlocking mobilities and displacements are all situated within longer histories of colonialism, as I've said, of imperial legacies of uneven global development. There will be no sustainability transition without mobility justice and without what we might even call a mobility justice revolution because decolonial thought has to be at the heart of critical mobility studies or we will just keep reproducing the system as it is even with different fuel source sources and at the same time the routinization of hydrocarbons and the globalization of their production hides the origins of carbon cultures making invisible to most consumers the ways in which our carbon-based cultures are built upon colonial and imperial histories, as I've said, of resource extraction, land appropriation, labor exploitation, and continue to be, right? This is not just in the past, this is now. And so I focus attention on how material cultures embed energy in forms that become taken for granted, forming what John referred to, citing Raymond Williams, as structures of feeling, energy infrastructures that inform every aspect of the built environment, including forms of mobile privatization, as Williams called it. And you know, this image kind of captures the 1950s American dream of an automated highway with this mobile privatization of the, um, you know, the nuclear family uh, in a very normative um, framework. So that, that kind of dream of the future has been with us for quite a while. The only way we can even begin to imagine sustainable mobility futures is if we attack and uproot the mobility regimes that it is built upon, um, 
the social injustices, the racial inequity, the extractivism, the uneven geographies of geopolitical power, and the unequal patterns of consumption that are driving ecocide and genocide around the world. And those, to me, are the political questions that the climate emergency needs to understand and to consider and look at. In my own work, I became very uh, increasingly interested in linking together the problems of sustainability transitions in terms of like transport and automobility and urban infrastructure with the problems of social justice, global inequities and questions of power and the politics of relational immobilities, um, including tourism and migration as part of that. So the dominant mobility regimes that are premised on these differential systems, on splintered infrastructures, on new enclosures, on deadly borders, and uneven, they produce uneven access to movement and to mobility space. And I argued in my book, Mobility Justice, that this control over mobility space and these injustices in, in it have deep historical roots in patriarchy, colonialism, imperialism, and racial capitalism. So different forms of mobilities of people, of materials, of ideas, of technologies, of knowledge, of viruses, even as we've seen, are always already implicated in producing and reproducing these unequal social relations, unequal subjectivities, unequal places, unequal spatial practices. It was actually in, um, to come to Agustina's mention of hurricanes, it was in it was reflections in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2005, was that? And also the earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010 and then subsequent hurricanes since then, that I've become even more convinced that understanding these deeper histories of the spatial formations of uneven mobilities are crucial to understanding the limits of contemporary sustainability transitions. Mm -hmm. And I began to think in terms of a twin transition needed towards environmental sustainability or sustainable mobility and mobility justice. Like that one cannot happen without the other. And I argue that the concept of mobility justice can highlight these, um, you know, divisions uh, that are distributed structurally across class, racial, gendered, and other inequalities in the potential for mobility. Like that it's that structuring that shapes the, the world and our possibility for a different future. Um, so I argued, for example, in some work on mobility transitions and mobility justice, um, that a full transition away from the current dominant automobility system will only take place when we simultaneously address the issues of social inequality that underpin the unsustainability of the current system, and that we begin to promote mobility justice as integral to sustainability. So this vision has shaped my subsequent work and brought into focus the question of climate reparations, which I'm going to end with, and which can be understood, I think, as aligned with John Ari's work, which had this attack on elite forms of ev evasion of responsibility. So in his work on, which some people see as like tangential, his work on secrecy jurisdictions, on tax evasion, and on offshoring, it was about how do we get the kinetic elites to pay up, right? To be responsible, to take responsibility for the harm that has been done in the world. Um, so let me go to my final section on decolonial mobility justice and, uh, and climate reparations. So the highly industrialized and now maybe post-industrialized countries in the global north have directly disrupted ecologies and displaced people around the world through extractive industries that uh, are able, as John would put it, they're able to roam the world. He always used that phrase of like the capital and industry roaming the world, polluting and destroying land, water, and air. High mobility lives consume excessive fossil fuel, emitting greenhouse gases, which lead to global warming, which affects everyday life through extreme weather patterns, such as 
hurricanes, drought, flooding, and excessive heat that we've all been experiencing. And the new enclosures, and I take that, that word from the work of Silvia Federici and George Cafensis, the new enclosures of land and water, which are happening ongoing all the time, um, along with the collapse of biodiverse ecologies, displace local relations of living in and with places. And it also drives social violence. So ecosystem disruption has the greatest impacts on places and populations in the global south, both human and non-human, which are under the most pressure for these new developments, these new enclosures, these new displacements that are happening all the time. And there are people who are already more vulnerable to climate risks because of the parts of the world where they're located. Um, and this is these images are just a reminder of the you know the climbing um, CO2 levels which continue right to go up and off the charts and the um, the the supposed effort at carbon capture and storage and how we keep coming up with technical technological solutions that we think are going to get us out of this and we every time we sort of float those technological solutions we're not dealing with the underlying questions of power and inequality and of the other things I've been referring to. So the global north has been built upon and continues to impose a climate crisis on other parts of the world, places and people that were already experiencing socio-ecological crises due to the violence of the colonial capitalist settler uh, enclosure and displacement and inequitable systems of imposed debt and public austerity. And we see people like this is a, a mother and her two twin daughters from Honduras being tear gassed as they try to cross the US border. Um, and mobility justice offers us a way to, as I say, kino politically understand how the energy consumption associated with our fossil fueled mobilities of driving cars, flying in airplanes, living in single family suburban homes, and other excessive use of energy impacts climate displacement and involuntary migration around the world. So the climate driven causes of migration or what can broadly be called climate mobilities to use um, the, the name uh, that uh, Ingrid Boas and another uh, group have theorized, um, these climate mobilities are deeply entangled with mobility injustices. Uneven climate mobilities and immobilities are then shaping and shaped by these cruel border regimes that stop the transnational mobility and limit people's migration with really deadly outcomes. And we see thousands of people dying as they seek to reach a safe haven. I mean, we had the catastrophic sinking in the Mediterranean um, of the migrant ship, another um, heading to um, uh, the Cape Verdean Islands, uh, you know, constantly in the U.S. border, dead bodies in the desert. I mean, our borders are death traps right now, and our border policies are death traps. So the call for mobility justice challenges what some have called green gentrification in cities wherein the racialized poor are displaced and unhoused and we see increasing you know a housing crisis while new low carbon infrastructures seem to only benefit the upper middle classes and mobility justice also challenges climate colonialism wherein low carbon energy transitions are premised on extractive sacrifice zones that further the displacement of rural and indigenous communities for the sake of mining things like lithium, cobalt, bauxite, rare earths, et cetera, to build the electric infrastructure that will supposedly save the global north. Even damming rivers to be used for so-called clean hydropower um, or seizing land to be used for carbon offsets and promises of net zero are false solutions to the problem because they're still not dealing with the coloniality of climate change. Our quest for low carbon energy is driving, for example, lithium mining in the Atacama Desert of Chile, 
bauxite mining is pushing into um, new parts of Guinea and South America, expanded aluminium smelters in Guinea and Suriname and Brazil, the opening of deep sea mining, or mining in the Sami lands in Sweden in search of rare earths, which there's a big controversy over right now, many other new resource frontiers. The green energy transition is premised on unsustainable extractive industries and mobility injustices. So the coloniality of climate is a, a idea that loops together questions of human justice with questions of more than human ethics and the rights of nature uh, in regard to the socio-ecological transformations that are embedded in modern energy cultures at every scale. And ultimately, the, this asks us to seek to decolonize mobilities by bringing critical mobility theory and decolonial theory together in an analysis of just mobility transitions that will not further pollute, displace, and dispossess <laughs> communities, especially of Black, Indigenous, and Aboriginal people, which are the ones that are being affected by this right now. An understanding of the history of racial capitalism and of ecocidal extractivism as intrinsic to our current climate condition requires concerted collective action to decolonize mobilities and imagine alternative mobile ontologies to end these destructive extractive economies that are feeding our excessive energy consumption in the global north. That's why we use too much energy. We use it too cheaply because of the impacts of our world making activities and our industrial and our imperial and militaristic activities. So the question is not just one of climate, climate adaptation or building climate resilience for affected regions in the global south, as it's often framed in the current mainstream policy agenda, you know, which is like, oh, well, we have to help them because they're, they need more resilience. But it's a question of climate justice and climate debt, which leads me to the strong argument for climate reparations. Countries that have been the largest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions cannot simply replace fossil fuel extraction with other renewable energy extraction because it's an extractive industry, even if it's renewable, and continue while continuing our patterns of high energy consumption and ignoring our climate debt to others. This for me is the lesson to be derived from the entire body of mobilities research and in particular, John Ari's work on mobilities, complexity, and futures. Even green forms of development and low carbon mobilities might further extend colonial legacies that exacerbate existing racial injustices and environmental injustices if nothing is done to prevent the kinetic elite from simply using more energy. And that's what John refers to as the rebound effect, it comes out of the idea of the Jevons paradox, that even as we make things more efficient, we just end up using more and more energy. The energy transition must be achieved through energy justice, environmental justice, and mobility justice, or it may not happen in any real sense at all. So for example, um, even as we install more and more hydropower and solar farms and wind farms in the United States, we're seeing a huge use soaking up that renewable energy to power things like electric SUVs and trucks, which are extremely heavy, have huge batteries and huge demands for renewable energy. Bitcoin mining, which has grown exponentially since you may know that China, um, which had been the hotbed of Bitcoin mining operations, they closed them down in Sichuan province and they all left and they came to Texas. Um, why did they come to Texas? Because Texas has a particular kind of electricity grid that's separate from the rest of the national grid that allows them to have cheap energy prices. Um, we're also using more and more energy for applications of cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things. Those need energy too. And all of these will consume increasing amounts of renewable energy rather than replacing existing energy consumption. And that's why our technological solutions will not address the problem unless they address the underlying unequal distributions that lead to energy overconsumption in the first place. 
So along with groups like Beyond Tokening and People for Mobility Justice, which are activist groups in the US who are looking at um, mobility justice through this lens of um, arguing that we need to include the historical disenfranchisement and disinvestment, disproportionate exposure to pollution and repressive policing of communities of color, um, because that's at the heart of the mobility injustices that we find in the world. And I've argued that a deeper kinopolitical transformation must be grounded in a pluriversal politics, including principles of mobility justice that challenge these uneven relations of immobilities and mobilities that have created the current environmental and climate crisis. When we speak of an ecological crisis and the urgent need to envision new sustainable futures, we must be able to envision and imagine a future beyond coloniality, beyond the globalization of the racial colonial settler state and its techno-scientific projects and beyond neo-colonial forms of citizenship, exclusion, and disposability. This calls for climate reparations as a first step of acknowledging the real harm that has been done by our current mobility regimes and continues to be done. So I'll move to my conclusion on, um, I'm calling it mobilizing kinetic communities. I got that word from Rodanti Tinelli. I was talking about kinetic elites and she said, well, what about kinetic communities? So I'm still thinking about it. Maybe it's kinopolitical communities, but bringing the communities back in. Um, climate catastrophe as a colonial condition uh, is part of my argument in my book, Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, where I um, point towards the work of Malcolm Ferdinand on decolonial ecologies and how capitalism, colonialism, and slavery changed climate in the past and continue to do so to today, today while creating the gradients of vulnerability to its consequences. And I draw on the work of Sylvia Winter, the Jamaican, wonderful Jamaican theorist, who talks about our contemporary condition as the interconnected poverty, hunger, habitat, energy, trade, population, atmosphere, waste, resource problem. That's a mouthful, but I think it's a pretty good way to think about it. So while the mobilities paradigm arose out of a transatlantic perspective, it has not always centered the ocean itself as an active agent of both transportation and climate change. But I think we need to remind ourselves that human and animal and plant mobilities depend on the kinetic energy of the atmospheres, which are driven of the atmosphere, which is driven by the heating of the oceans or the sinking of cool, you know, water to, in the ocean. Um, the planetary hydrological cycles determine weather patterns, including what we've been experiencing in terms of excessive heat, floods and hurricanes and fires, which easily disrupt human mobilities, whether on land, through the oceans or in the air. Can we <clears throat> limit or slow our mobilities in ways that will create more equitable forms of dwelling and moving? that also challenge the kinopolitical legacies of the poverty, hunger, habitat, energy, trade, population, atmosphere, waste, resource problem, and mobility injustice. So counter to the mobility regimes of the kinetic elites, we might think instead about mobilizing kinetic communities, communities that distribute mobilities more equitably between humans and non-humans, and hydrological systems of mobility of water. Kinetic communities would seek to limit the impacts of their mobilities on others, human and more than human. And they would synchronize their movements more effectively with those of the natural world, of the seas, of the atmosphere, of the hydrological cycle. If we are to form more sustainable kinetic communities, then we must first acknowledge past harms and then build more livable futures together. Our contemporary climate emergency, as I've said, founded in the history of violent, coercive colonial settler states and extractive industries, disrupted natural systems, and is based in the transatlantic system of plantation slavery, the worldwide systems of colonization and indentured labor. Those built 
the, the modern socio-ecological technical system that we all still depend on. And the coloniality of climate is furthered today by the present anti-Black and anti-Indigenous border regimes that deepen human vulnerability and expand ecocidal forms of uneven development. Global mobility justices continue to influence who has access to resources, to safety, and to livable ecologies while continuing to destroy what remains of the biodiversity of complex living ecosystems. So the new mobilities paradigm leads towards political ecologies and ethical positions that not only support the aims of decolonial movements, but also urge us to form kinetic communities to imagine some kind of what I've called mobile commoning in opposition to the self-serving liberties and mobile privatization of the kinetic elite. Mobility justice demands that we not only reduce the excessive consumption of fossil fuel mobility, but also repair and prevent the injustices of the unending indigenous and black expropriations, displacements, and global resource extraction, even in its green forms. Um, we have to recognize the necessity of deconstructing racialized mobility regimes, the need for climate reparations to make up for existing loss and damages, and the ethical demand for mobile commoning that would limit our excessive energy use. This would transition or transformation or revolution would unmake global carbon form, would demand that fossil fuel companies pay for loss and damages resist the new enclosures by standing against the disposability of life and standing with the frontline communities of Black, Indigenous, and Native peoples and supporting a human and more than human commoning through practices of relational ethics. So to end, I'll just say that two decades on from our founding of Seymour, we see ongoing political struggles over the implications of global decarbonization and mobility transitions. And I think it's important that the social sciences play a new part in these intersectional struggles for decolonized mobilities by addressing the ongoing legacies of colonialism and ecocidal extractive industries that have shaped our world. And this is why I call the new mobilities paradigm a live social science, meaning a vital field of relational ethics and compelling purpose to engage normatively with the worlds we have made and continue to make. Only by joining others in the ongoing practices of relational ethics of care might we hold open a place for ongoing life. And this brings us fully to John's final book, What is the Future?, which challenges social science to engage with the shaping of the future. And this ultimately is the task before us. And I was going to end with some other comments, but I think we've run out of time. So yeah. let's stop Thanks, there. Amy. Thank you. Running. That's, that was my biggest concern. I thought we were beginning to lose our audience, but it sounds as though they're still there, which is great. So I'm now going to hand over to David Tyfield, who's going to share some questions. I'm, I'm going to just stand by the online people to see if any come in. Thank you. sound off, so I'm going right. put it back on because during. Right. So is it, is it on? Is uh, yeah. Because. Uh, yeah, because it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought maybe that's been. Okay. Well, thank you. Can I just ask you what's the timing? Well, I, I think we're after six, so we, you know, we pro probably should only take probably about ten minutes or so, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's okay for me. Yeah. yeah. You need to be near the mic, not me. Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, we'll take questions from the audience first, and then you're going to. I'm going to look at the chat. Yeah. Look at the chat. Great. Um, so comments, questions for me. Please. Um, and, and, and then I'll repeat it for the um, for the people online. Okay. Well, I, I, thank you so much, Lumi. That was fantastic and really spelling out the origins and the nature of the problem that we have. That you know, low poverty, um, waste, waste inequality problems. 
I would love to hear your thoughts on what are we going to do? How are we going to make this list pay reparations? And does that involve um, a merger with theories on social movements? Especially, I'm thinking in Black Studies, the idea of the undercommons, a sort of uprising from below, and the idea that in collapsology, people are talking about just a few millions of people refusing to participate in the system, thinking about a, a system collapse. So how how are we going to do it? What what do you think? So <laughs> while you're thinking, maybe I'll just repeat the question for those of you online. Uh, I hope for, just in case you didn't hear, um, Monica's question was, um, how is how are we going to do it? Uh, basically, <laughs> sure. and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, thanks, Monica, for a tough question. And I mean, I, I would sort of speak to the collapsology as um, a, a dystopian future that certainly is possible. And, you know, and John talks about our futures um, possible, plausible, probable, and, you know, which ones are, are coming. Obviously, may or may not be the most desirable one, depending on your point of view. But if we want to stick to, okay, maybe collapse will happen and uprising will happen. But um, on the other hand, if we are trying to do some work towards a more utopian future, I think you're asking what could we do? Um, and I'll just say, I was going to end the talk by talking about the future of education. And one thing I'm involved with right now is this Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network. And the idea is that the, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands have been the leading voices calling for loss and damages. They've been the ones theorizing climate reparations, trying to build the financial mechanisms internationally for climate reparations, arguing for the ethics and the justice behind it. And the Caribbean Climate Adaptation Network is um, currently based in the US Caribbean, but is gonna work with islands across the region and then network with Pacific Islands as well. And so the question is, can we take those voices that have already sort of thought of this way forward and sort of help build those up and support those? So if we're ever going to get payment of loss and damages or reparations, it's going to need this kind of worldwide networked effort to influence this international community or the international legal jurisdictions that are taking lawsuits out against fossil fuel companies. They're working in the UN, they're working with the major fin international financial institutions. So they're, they're operating on every front to try to put as much pressure as they can on the kinetic elites. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, there is also a, an online question. Um, okay, so, yeah, um, yeah. so hands again. Uh, three hands. <laughs> um, so why don't we just take these four questions and then we'll stop. Okay. okay and so then do you online. mind if we yeah. take all three at the same them, time yeah. uh, and then we'll go online. So Manas, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, also because it sort of just relates to uh, my question. I, I feel like there's some language around uh, the discourse of collapse or dystopia or utopia, which, which uh, somehow goes back to sort of classic humanist thinking about uh, dialectics or this kind of uh, thresholds which switch between one extreme and another. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is possibility to think about futures in, in more of a kind of everyday spectrum sense mm -hmm. where nothing is truly either dystopic or utopian, mm -hmm. There is no collapse because you know there is no yield point. And, and I was talking over the lunch about how I feel like with my work in in in, in Delhi and parking, there is no yield point. I don't see a point where people will suddenly start walking out and giving up their cars. That's not going to happen. So uh, yeah, just to, how do you think about futures that are not either satisfactory in any sense? of either being complete, you know, destroy the system or we have one. Okay, great, thanks, Banas. So yeah, just again for the audience, that first question was sort of querying the idea of dystopia. Is that okay as a summary? Yeah. 
Delcy. Uh, thank you. Um, I think maybe you call the talk mobility justice and climate reparations instead of like mobility justice and climate justice. But a lot of the examples that you gave, for example, the uh, what's happening in the Caribbean now, that comes under in the discourse that comes under climate justice. And although like mobility justice, the idea like philosophically, ontologically, and everything really resonates with me. But I'm just wondering, is it too complicated for to to have the same level of currency and traction as climate justice has in public discourse? Uh, and if it doesn't, does it matter? Is it just okay for us to talk about it in academia, but when we go out in the world, let us translate it into climate justice because people understand what we're talking about, or is that reductionism? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the, the, that question was about the relationship between mobility justice and climate justice, and uh, do we need two terms in, in a sense? Uh, and then finally, Bing. I can. Yes, go on, you come up here. That'd be quicker, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so my question is about the paradigm itself. Uh, so because I've been listening to different paradigms, people talking about, for example, they try to say sustainable, sustainability, sustainability paradigm. So I want to know uh, when you establish this paradigm and with more and more people using this paradigm and to justify mobility as a paradigm, how can we uh, not avoid talking about real issues instead of uh, trying to justify paradigm? Paradigm itself. Mm -hmm. I hope I make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and you, you, no, yeah, okay. Over to you, and then we'll do the final question online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me let me start with Dulce's question, just because I'll say um, I thought that at first mobility justice might be a hard concept to gain any traction, but what I found in in the US at least, is that the organizations like People for Mobility Justice and a whole range of other um, transportation related equity movements have already picked up and incorporated the idea of mobility justice. In fact, they arrived at it independently, as I describe in my book, Mobility Justice, while I was sitting there kind of coming up with these like theories of justice and explaining it, they were just out there doing the work and mobility justice became a meaningful term for them. And it's especially meaningful insofar as it bridges um, environmental justice, racial justice, migrant justice. Like they all can understand each other and climate justice, like through mobility justice became a locus for joining those conversations together. So that would be my hope for the productivity of the term is that actually everyday people do understand it and they can start from their own embodied experience and then they can extrapolate it to other wider instances. So it does seem to be catching on. Um, um, oh my goodness, Manus, what? About dystopias. Dystopias and utopias, right, the binary. Y yeah, so the way that future scenario thinking works is it creates these um, extreme uh, sort of ideal types or something. And it's not meant that like, actually we're gonna arrive at one or the other of them, but it's a way to organize um, our thinking and our practices within, it's, it's often used as like a two by two quadrant. And then you can sort of think about, okay, so we're having all of these at once and some tendencies are pulling in this direction and some are in that direction and some of the, And so it's not necessarily saying it's just a binary choice. It's kind of creating a field of thought and then all the everyday muddling through in actual policy contexts kind of gets or organized according to that those fields. And they're they're usually not just binary, they're like quad quadrary or something, whatever you call that. <laughs> but yeah, I think we could use more thought on how we um, enact that kind of muddling through things more successfully. Um, and being on um um thinking about the getting beyond just thinking about paradigms is we um we yes in academia yeah we talk about things like paradigms and stuff like that but i think a lot of us are also engaged in practices as well and relationality with governmental non-governmental civil society um act movements and activism so i think people are addressing all of those things at the same time. They're kind of doing them together. 
Um, but it's important, I think, to recognize that like knowledge practices come out of popular practices also, mm -hmm. and like knowledge is embodied. And um, kind of like Agostino was arguing earlier, you can find these archives of thought within popular culture. Um, or as was it Monica who mentioned the undercommons as an idea. So not all paradigmatic thinking um, is, is universities, is, that's not all that matters. But I think for us to have these conversations, it does, it can help to talk about what, reflect on how are we actually thinking about it. Okay, oh, right. one very final um, question, and it's good to bring in one of our colleagues online, and it's, it's no other than Heath Mom, of course, the originator of the Transverse Journal. So, Heath, would you like to come in and speak? Hopefully that's going to work. Okay, can you can you hear me? Oh, yes, you can. Brilliant. Thank uh, okay, you. okay, let me start with congratulate you, uh, Mimi, with your 20th anniversary. Thank and, you. Uh, and all the others who have made this possible. And as you probably know, I'm one of the co-founders of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic and Mobility, which also last year celebrated its, its 20th birthday uh, in Padua. And um, next this year uh, celebrates uh, again in two phases in Seoul, uh, South Korea. Uh, and on both occasions, uh, the celebration is about uh, humanities that are included in, in um, the um, mobility paradigm. And that is about my, uh, that's my question is about that. Um, uh, if I remember well, in 2017, Lynn and uh, I think Peter Merriman and a third author, I'm not sure, wrote, uh, published in, in Mobilities, uh, a piece in which they reflected on uh, including uh, history in the mobility paradigm. And as I, if I remember correctly, they uh found they, they felt a bit uneasy because uh, of the uh the using of, by historians of text and uh, so i know that you uh, um, mimi are an historian by upbringing at least partly and uh, peter merriman has has written an excellent book on the history of uh, uh, british uh, motorways, you on aluminium and in your Caribbean books are lots of history. And yet, if I read mobilities, um, history is mostly lacking. Hmm. And I, I am wondering uh, whether you, uh, well, you, you cannot solve this problem, I think, at this moment. And I will certainly uh, reflect on that because I've been invited uh, to be to give the keynote uh, lecture in in Korea on this problem. But perhaps you can reflect on that as an historian. Uh, why this is so? Why is it so difficult for historians to find mobilities as a platform to reflect on the history of of mobility? Because you know, you, you posited, uh, you, uh, uh, what is it, proposed a kind of um, uh, um, slogan, uh, there will be no sustainable transition without a mobility justice revolution, I think that you said. Mm -hmm. And I will, would like to, to defend this year another claim, there will be no transition without an historical understanding of this whole <laughs> mobility uh, yes. uh, regime. Thanks. Thanks, Hayes. Um, so for our global online audience who weren't here earlier in the day, we heard some wonderful reflections on this 20th anniversary from Lynn Pierce talking about mobilities and humanities, from uh -huh. uh, Colin Cooley talking about mobilities and history, and from Jen Southern talking about mobilities and creative arts practices. So uh -huh. We've been, we have um, been including those views in our conversations today, and I'll just um, add that, I mean, I, as you say, my origin is in history and literature, and I still do work that is historical, and I still do work on arts and um, creativity as it intersects with mobilities. So I continue to think of those as important 
parts of the field. I think your question is about the mobilities journal per se. Yes. And thank goodness we have the journal transfers, um, which <laughs> Uh, covers much more of the literary and historic, and now the new journal, Mobility and Humanities, being published out of Concook University, it's Academy of Mobility Humanities, which even reaches even further into the arts and humanities um, in their view of this field of mobilities. Um, and I'll just say, I think, again, a little bit of the division is like a disciplinary thing and what our traditions are of analysis and citation and how we use evidence and all of that stuff yes, um, yes, and artifacts yes, yes. of our disciplines. Well, but I think this is a point that we should discuss further, further, uh, uh, you know, these two social sciences and, and humanities, how, how they can be brought together in a more disciplinary way. Yep. That was my yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And thanks for coming. So, Yes. Okay. So, uh, can I ask everyone to uh, thank Mimi appropriately with, with a round of applause? Waving goodbye to all around the world, demonstrating. Thank you. And um, thanks, thanks very much for coming, and we'll, we'll see you again. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Shall we? Shall we <laughs>